Um, yeah, so I probably won't be telling you everything, but um, I'll do my best. Um, have we got to move on to... So this is, this is mostly going to be a sort of summary of 80,000 hours, key advice. So if there are people here who are fairly familiar with that, I apologize. But hopefully it will be like a nice review anyway. Um, this is a nice 80,000 hours logo. Um, and I guess I want to start by just talking about why I think careers advice and career choice is so important. Um, most people spend like at least 80,000 hours of their life on their, on their work, on their job, hence the name which is an incredible amount of time. Um, and so I think that means that it's like one of the biggest decisions we're making over our lives, potentially. Like, apart from perhaps your choice of spouse or your choice of whether to have children or not, it's like probably the biggest decision. And it's incredibly important for both your own happiness, just because it's hard to be happy with your life if um, you're like not happy at 80,000 hours of it, and for the difference you make in the world, because that's just like a huge amount of time to spend on solving um, social problems. But I think that it's kind of surprising that most people don't spend that much time thinking about their choice of career, given that. Um, like, even if you just spent 1% of those hours trying to figure out what to do with the other 99%, that would be 800 hours, which is about 20 working weeks. I'd be pretty surprised if most people spend that amount of time, but it definitely seems worth it. And I think that the reason that most people don't spend more time thinking about their careers is that they kind of don't really know where to start. Um, there are like a huge amount of options out there. There are so many criteria. You can't really hold it all in your head at once. And it's kind of difficult to get very good information about the different careers out there. I definitely remember feeling like this when I graduated. I just sort of felt like overwhelmed with options. Like I didn't even really know what the options were. Um, and there wasn't particularly good advice out there. Like I felt that would help me navigate those options. There's like a university career service that will kind of like give me information about a bunch of specific jobs, but not really how to compare them. Um, and the conventional careers advice focuses very much on sort of slogans like, I had a lot of sort of like, do what you're passionate about or go with your gut. And, and I don't think that those things are particularly useful or actionable for most people. Um, so at 80,000 hours, really what we want to do is to do better, um, to like help people navigate these different difficult decisions by providing much better information about specific career paths and particularly their impact on the world, but also how to figure out like if you'll enjoy them or not. And also pro by providing like a kind of better framework for thinking about these issues and, and support for, for navigating these things. And one thing that's sort of surprising to me is that it's kind of how boring and unsexy careers advice is considered. Like, if you'd asked me three years ago if I wanted to work on careers advice, I probably would have been very unenthusiastic. Um, but now I'm actually really excited about it because I think that there's this area that is really neglected and really important to most people. Um, and it's somewhere that we can really make progress. Um, so this is just an overview of um, the things I'm going to talk about right now. Um, briefly, just like explicitly saying, like, what do we mean by making a difference with your career? Um, talking through some key considerations for thinking about making an impact, which we think it's useful to break down. Um, some common mistakes that people make when thinking about the impact of their career, um, and some common mistakes that specifically EAs make, I think. Some, some potential prom promising career paths, although this will kind of no, by no means cover all of the career paths that ATK thinks are valuable, I should say. Um, and some useful general principles for thinking about these decisions. Um, so to begin with, um, at 80,000 hours, we define making a difference. This is what it says on our website, as the extent to which you contribute to solving social problems faster than would, would, would have happened otherwise. And I've bolded this would have happened otherwise part because I think that this is really crucial. Um, many of you have probably heard this, but to illustrate, imagine that you kind of stumble on the scene of an accident and you rush over and like push a paramedic out of the way and give someone CPR. And you save their life, but you break a few of their ribs because you're not very good at it. Um, and your, so your tangible impact is positive. Um, you've saved the person's life. It's like, you know, the, the tangible impact is like the direct impact of what you do on the world. But your true impact, which is the impact of, which is kind of like the impact of your actions relative to what have happened otherwise, is clearly negative. Like probably if you let the paramedic do the job, the person would have, you know, survived but not had the broken ribs. So this is an important thing to think about in career decisions and in making a difference more generally. Um, it it kind of gets quite complicated. This has also been called replace, replaceability a lot at 80,000 hours. It's, in some ways with careers it gets a little bit more complicated because it's like hard to know how you're influencing the sector by like going into the job and, and it can be overstated, but it's, it's definitely an important thing to consider. Um, so there are three key questions to think about um, when thinking about the impact of a career. 
Um, kind of firstly, the obvious question, like what is my impact while I'm working at this job? Like what am I doing? Um, but not just this, um, we also think it's important to think about um, how what you're learning and doing at the job now might affect your ability to have an impact later and your personal fit, how well suited you are to the job. And which is really important for both your motivation and just your ability to do the job well and therefore have an impact in the job. Um, so I'll just talk about each of these in a little bit of detail, more in turn. Um, so your role impact, which is the impact you have directly in the job, is the thing that conventional careers advice mostly talks about. Um, and obviously it's very important, um, but we think that there are like a few different ways actually that you can have an impact in the, in the role that you do. Firstly, by kind of your direct, the, the labor that you provide um, in the job. So this might be by um, making an effective organization more effective by like improving their operations, or it might be through the research that you do as an academic and the value of that. There's also the money that you earn to donate. So it might be that the actual labor you're providing in the job is not super valuable, but that you're able to earn a lot of money and you can direct that towards causes that you think are really effective. Um, and so this is kind of part of the idea that we've called earning to give. Um, the idea of like going and taking a very high paying job in order to then donate a lot of money to effective causes. I should emphasize that like in the past and maybe a bit still now, like 80,000 hours has been associated with like just this idea of earning to give, which is very much not the case. I think it's more that it's the idea that was like most interesting to the media. Um, but it is, it is a potentially good career path. So we think that, you know, making a difference in your career is a lot broader than that but it's potentially a good career path for someone who you know, is really well suited to and would really well in, enjoy a high paying job and has some cause area that they you know, think is underfunded and, and they can really add more value to by donating. And thirdly, you can have impact in, in your role through influencing others and advocating to get other people to have more impact. And I think that this one is often neglected too, partly because it's something that you can do in any job. Um, Obviously, some jobs give you more of a platform for impact than others, like politics, for example. But, um, you know, like kind of even if you can just persuade one person to donate as much as you're donating or to care as much as you care about a cause and work on it, then you've doubled your impact. So that's potentially like a huge way to make a difference and something that you can kind of do on the side of any job. But especially if you're early in your career, um, we tend to think that at least as important as, if not more important than the impact that you have in the job kind of directly is the extent to which the job allows you to develop skills and a network and credentials to have more impact later. This is partly just because the people who make the biggest difference in the world are often people who've like, accumulated expertise and kind of got to a position of, of authority where people will listen to them or kind of at the top of their field and so having greater insights. Um, so maybe it's a mistake to kind of worry too much about the impact that you're having early on and better to kind of focus on getting to that position later where you can actually like create large change in the world. The other good thing about focusing on developing um, what we call career capital is that it allows you to keep your options open if early on you're not really sure about um, what kinds of causes you should be working on or what kinds of jobs you're going to most enjoy. Um, so if you, you know, develop very broadly useful skills like management, say, or programming or data science or like really good communication skills, and these are things that you could apply to a really wide range of, of causes and areas. Um, it also just provides kind of exploration value. It like means that if you're trying to develop career capital, then you probably want to go and try a bunch of different things. And that is like a really valuable way to just learn about what you'll enjoy and what you'll be good at and where you can make the most difference. Um, and the final factor that seems really important to consider is your personal fit. Um, and so th there's this kind of like the, uh, the typical kind of like conventional careers advice slogan that I mentioned, which is do what you're passionate about, which is often used. Um, I and 80,000 Hours more generally has spent a decent amount of time pushing against this and, and criticizing it. Um, and I think for good reason. So I think that do what you're passionate about isn't that useful because a lot of people don't have very clear passions um, or at least not clear passions that translate into jobs. I think I remember reading a statistic about um, the number of people in the US who want to be basketball players and like the number of basketball jobs is just like, you know, like a huge difference. So, um, and they definitely don't necessarily translate into jobs that improve the world. It's also just the fact that I think this gets things the wrong way around. Passion is not a thing that lies deep inside you to be found. It's, it's a thing that you develop through mastering an area and through learning and gaining expertise. And it's hard to be passionate about something that you don't have any experience with, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't be passionate about it. Um, so I don't like do what you're passionate about, 
but I do think that there's a grain of truth in it, which is that it is, it is important to be passionate about what you do, even if that's not the criteria by which you choose a career. Um, because it's really important to be really motivated and enjoy what you do, and to be good at it and be able to excel if you want to be effective in that career path. Um, so, like, rather than start kind of telling people that they should do what they're passionate about, we do say that we do think that personal fit, um, insofar as that is really enjoying and really being able to excel in what you do, is incredibly important. And the, the caveat here is that personal fit is really important, but we think that we're not necessarily that good at judging in advance where our best personal fit will be. Um, so we're a little bit wary of kind of like using personal fit as, as too large a criteria for deciding in advance, especially if you're trying to judge personal fit using like more intuitive um, judgments. So it's perhaps better to, to try and judge where I think that people think too narrowly about what they can enjoy and be good at, basically, because we have very li limited experience. And so we think that we will only enjoy things that we've done in the past and we'll only be good at things that we've done in the past. So um, I tend to recommend taking a more empirical approach to figuring out personal fit um, rather than just going with your intuitions. So looking at like the research on job satisfaction, looking at like talking to other people in jobs and finding out like what the day-to-day -day work is actually like. Um, actually going and trying things out yourself and just finding out what you enjoy and what you're good at. Um, on the job satisfaction stuff, so I, sp I spent a bit of time whilst working for ATK doing some research on job satisfaction and looking at, you know, there's a fairly wide body of research on this stuff, what kinds of factors do seem to like actually predict job satisfaction the most strongly. Um, and there are a few that come out as kind of the key ones. Um, the first is independence, so ability to decide when and where you work. Um, sense of completion, so feeling like you kind of like get to work on a task from start to finish and you have a sense of that kind of, yeah, like satisfaction of getting something done. Um, variety is pretty self-explanatory. Um, the extent to which you get feedback from the job. So, for example, if you're working in sales, you have pretty good feedback because you're like going out and you're just like, you know how much you're selling and so that tells you how well you're doing. Whereas if you are a PhD student, for example, um, you don't necessarily get very good feedback on like how things are going until the end of the like five-year period. Um, I, I may use the example of a PhD student quite a lot just because it's like salient to me. But um, sense of contribution, which is obviously um, fits well with kind of everyone's aims here and um, ATK. I mean, a difficult thing here is that it seems like what's important for satisfaction is feeling like you're contributing to a wider cause than yourself which obviously isn't always the same thing as like actually making the most effective contribution. Um, but like, you know, it, it helps and you can try, try to align those things. Um, and finally, social support. So like feeling like you have people around you who you can turn to in your work and colleagues that you get on with. And these are all pretty intuitive, but I also think that what's interesting about them is that they're not necessarily the kinds of things that like people kind of naturally go and look for when thinking about careers. I think we tend to, think about what we'll enjoy based on more global intuitive impressions and like, oh, that job sounds kind of cool and interesting. Um, whereas these are much more about like, what is the day-to-day -day work like? Um, like, what is your experience gonna be like on a weekly basis? Um, and maybe we actually think about these less and it's, it's worth thinking about more because, you know, whether you enjoy a job is actually gonna be, on a day-to-day -day basis, is gonna be less down to like, do I think this sounds cool? And more down to like, do I actually like what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis? And is it actually satisfying? Um, so I found thinking about these factors a bit more really useful and, and I definitely recommend if you're considering different careers, like actually trying to think about like how they score on each of these factors and um, yeah, and like kind of like trying to find out more information about um, the extent to which they score on each of these factors if you're not sure. Um, kind of on the, so I think that one example, like th these factors are kind of a good explanation for why a lot of people might like go into a PhD program, for example, and be really excited about like the top, like be excited about the interesting idea of doing research, but then not end up very happy because like they, you know, a PhD program doesn't necessarily score very well on these factors. Like you don't have very good sense of completion. You don't have a lot of variety. Um, you maybe don't have very good feedback from the job. You don't have good social support. So I think they're really worth thinking about. Um, yeah, okay, so having overviewed like a few of the key things to think about in comparing different careers, I now wanted to just talk about a few specific mistakes that I think people make when thinking about careers. Um, the first is seeing career choice as this, this big, single, high-pressure decision. I think a lot, of, a lot of the people that I knew, I saw graduating from university and feeling like they had to decide what they were going to be doing with the rest of their lives, then and there, there and then. 
Um, and that creates a huge amount of pressure. I, I know I said at the beginning of this talk, like career choice is really important and it's the most important decision you're ever gonna make in your life. And I think that's true, but you also don't wanna to put too much pressure on that at the beginning of the decision. You know, you, you don't need to spend those 800 hours choosing your career like right at the start. They should be more distributed. And actually it makes more sense to see career choice as a series of smaller decisions where you know like you, you make your best guess given the information you have right now, you go and try something, you learn more, and then you come back and reassess. And this also fits with the idea that we've seen a bit throughout this conference of you know, being open to changing your mind and the importance of that. So like not having to make this one decision and stick with it, but rather um, you know, starting out, trying something, learning, and then making another decision. And I think that that reduces the pressure too. Secondly, thinking too narrowly about your options. Um, I think this is partly due to what I said about we think too narrowly about what we'll enjoy and be good at because we base it on our past experience. Um, and this is one of the ways in which you're most going to limit your potential to do good in the world if you don't even consider a bunch of potentially really good options. So um, I definitely recommend if you're trying to make a career decision, like generating more options than seems reasonable or you know, even generating a bunch of options that don't necessarily sound like that appealing or the kinds of things you would necessarily consider yourself doing. You can always prune them down later, um, but thinking like a little bit more broadly rather than too narrowly, I think is, is really important. Um, and like going out and getting, you know, ways of doing this is like going out and getting ideas from other people or on the ATK website, we now have like, you know, a lot of career profiles and going through them and, and not writing things off immediately just because you kind of think that doesn't necessarily sound like my sort of thing. Um, and a third is, as I said before, like relying too much on intuitions and global impressions. I talked about this a bit yesterday in my rationality talk, but um, I think that you know our intuitions are reliable when we have a lot of experience and we've had a lot of feedback and the opportunity to learn. They're not reliable when, when we haven't had that most of the time. And I think for most people with career decisions, we, we haven't had that much experience with these, with these kinds of decisions and with different kinds of careers. So we don't necessarily have a very good sense intuitively of, of what we'll enjoy and be good at. Um, and these global impressions don't actually necessarily actually track um, what you'll be doing on a day-to-day -day basis and definitely don't necessarily track like how much impact you can have in a career. A few mistakes that I think are more specific to effective altruists and generally people in these communities. Um, tendency to get into analysis paralysis. So we talk a lot about the importance of being open-minded, but that can have downsides if it means that you spend your whole time questioning whether you're doing the right thing or not. Um, I've definitely had some experience with this. I started a PhD two years ago and sp spent like a decent chunk of the last two years trying to decide what my PhD topic should be and doing one thing and then worrying that maybe that's not the best thing and I should do something else. And I think it definitely got to a point like you know, a while ago where I would have been better off just picking something and doing it. Like we do need to, we need to be open-minded, but we also need to get to points where we just decide on a thing and, and execute and do that thing. One thing I found kind of useful for getting over this analysis paralysis is this idea of like batching your doubt. So rather than having these like doubts and uncertainties that niggle away in the back of your mind like all of the time and you never properly deal with, taking kind of like periods of time every now and then to properly sit down and, and deal with the doubts and process them and, and think about things thoroughly and, and then make a decision and then decide I'm going to stick with this for a month and then I'm going to reassess or something. I found that very helpful. Um, and just realizing that you know, you're never going to know what the best thing is and if something seems like pretty good and you've spent a decent, decent amount of time thinking about it, then going with that for a while is like fine. <laughs> Um, another one is potentially not coordinating with other effective altruists enough. So there are certain career paths like earning to give, for example, which seem like a very good option in isolation. But if all effective altruists were going into high paying careers to earn money to donate to effective altruist projects, and we didn't have anyone actually doing the effective altruist projects, then that wouldn't be a very good situation. And obviously that's an extreme example, but I think um, the point here is that it's worth considering where is it that I can add value to the EA movement that like, and you know, where is it that I, I have skills and, and expertise and or can develop those things that other people are not currently doing and, and trying to coordinate in that way. Um, Holden Karnofsky is from GiveWell has talked a lot about how the effective altruist movement really needs a kind of like l lots of people across really diversely useful areas with like narrow areas of expertise and how we want to have more th of that. So he was saying, you know, we want to have more people with experience in like, economic policy and, and, and various things. And, and I think that that's a really good point. And there's a worry that with the kinds of careers advice that ATK gives that we might end up pushing too many people into sort of the same kinds of roles. 
So it's just worth thinking about with your own career, and it's something we need to think about more for um, making sure we have people with like specific areas of expertise. Um, and finally, undervaluing personal fit. And this may be partly our fault because we've pushed so much against the do what you're passionate about meme. Um, but I think that, as I said, it's, it's kind of difficult because it's sometimes hard to judge in advance. But there are definitely people, I think, who've pushed themselves into career paths that seem high impact, but that, which they're not motivated by. And I think that's definitely a bad plan because you're just going to burn out and you're not going to make as much difference as, as you would. Um, so now I'll like just talk through a few specific career paths that um, ATK recommends is particularly promising. Again, like this is not you know all of the career paths that you should consider, but just a select few. Um, to, so to start with, like some solid bets, so things that just seem pretty solidly good. Um, the first is just, would just be to like work directly for highly effective organizations. Um, I've spoken to a few people like recently and even a couple of people today who were like interested in working for effective altruist organizations. I mean, when I say effective organizations, that doesn't necessarily mean EA orgs, but um, who are interested in working for EA organizations, but kind of thought, oh, well, you have so many people wanting to work for you. Like, I can't add that much value. But actually, a lot of these organizations are really struggling to find people who are really good fit for them and who like, are kind of like really motivated and dedicated. So if you can go to those organizations, you can definitely, like potentially, if you have the right skill set, make a huge difference. And it's also potentially a really good place to learn um, valuable skills, because somewhere like GiveWell, you know, I think is like a really good place for learning how to do effective research. And also working at smaller organizations is often really good for getting a variety of skills and getting a lot of responsibility. Um, second, just kind of broadly working on building skills in the short term, as I said. Um, so some jobs that might be particularly good for this, um, things like management consulting, sales and marketing, potentially doing a PhD um, in specific areas if you've got some idea of where you want to go with it in the future. Um, and these are also generally quite good for kind of building credentials um, that might help you later. Um, and thirdly, this idea of earning to give. Um, there are a bunch of different routes you could go down to do that. Um, there's some more competitive ones like finance and trading and entrepreneurship. Um, and some, it's kind of funny to say that like medicine is the less competitive um, thing, but um, like slightly less competitive maybe depending on your skill set, um, medicine and software engineering. Um, and the nice thing about these careers, especially early on as well, is that they're generally pretty good for building career capital as well because they're competitive and you develop useful skills. So you can definitely like combine some of these. Um, and then some more like high potential long shots. So these are careers where if you're successful, you could potentially have a huge um, impact, but it's like a little bit like harder and more uncertain whether you'll be successful. Um, entrepreneurship is one that I think um, effective altruists who are kind of willing to take the risk should consider a bit more um, for a few reasons, partly just because the expected earnings are very high, potentially higher than, than, higher than in finance, though it is higher variance. So there are more people who you know, fail and make nothing, but there are more people who make millions. Um, and there have definitely been some calculations that have been done kind of showing that I think on average, they looked at a bunch of startups that had already received VC funding and found that on average, um, at the time of exit, like companies were kind of leaving with like $9 million or something, which is quite a lot of money. So <laughs> pretty good from like an earning to give perspective. But also, like, as in contrast with something like finance, you have the potential to do good directly by like producing products that improve the world. So, um, I mean, you can also do nonprofit entrepreneurship, of course. Um, but then within for profit, you could do something like you know making products that make people like happier or more productive or like um, yeah, there's like a ton of stuff. But it's nice that you have this kind of potential to earn a lot of money and potential to um, do good directly. Plus, I think that it can also just be very good for career capital because um, generally, even if you fail, it looks quite impressive to have started your own company. And like you'll learn a lot of skills through just kind of like having to start a company, manage a team. You're getting a lot of real world feedback really fast and having to like develop a lot of broad skills. Um, a second one, which um, you just heard about from Sam, is is going into politics um, or doing advocacy more generally. Again, this is more of a long, sh long shot because um, it's much harder to like predict your chances of success of being an MP or you know getting high up in politics. But if you can get there, there's the potential for huge influence, influencing policy, influencing budgets. And I also think that it's really important that the effective altruism movement as a whole has more people who like are kind of immersed in politics and understand um, understand like how kind of getting policies 
in works because if we want to enact large scale change in the world, we need to understand that stuff. And I think that that's currently maybe somewhere where we're a bit limited. Um, and finally, um, another kind of long shot is high impact research. I say this is a long shot because um, it seems like the, the impact of research comes from like a very few individuals who make exceptional breakthroughs. So for example, um, there was a biologist um, called Norman Borlaug who has been credited with saving potentially up to a billion lives through developing like a disease resistant strain of wheat, which um, kind of like provided food for many like malnourished people in the developing world. Um, we obviously need researchers working on important problems across a wide range of disciplines, um, and there's definitely the potential to have huge impact there. Um, because the impact seems to come from a few exceptional individuals, this seems like a better bet if you think that you're, you've got a chance of being like, at, the top of, at the very top of your field. Although that said, um, just kind of caring a lot about doing important research and, and really optimizing for that and choosing what you work on based on that definitely will give you an advantage just because most people aren't doing that. Um, and the other consideration with research is that even if you don't you know, come up with some revolutionary breakthrough, if you manage to get to a point where um, you're like, you've got a fairly solid position within academia and you're, say, like a good communicator, then you could use that as a platform for more advocacy type stuff. Um, so being sort of like a, a public intellectual could potentially be quite a high impact career path. Um, and that's the thing you can do on the side too. So like spreading important ideas given academic credentials. Um, so to sum up, I was just going to talk through a few kind of more general principles um, for making better career decisions. Firstly, spend a decent amount of time exploring different options. I think most people do this way too little. If you can like, just take a couple of years and try lots of different things and learn about what you enjoy and what you're good at, I think you'll make much better decisions in future. Um, at least early in your career, work on like, building very flexible career capital, um, keeping your options open for later on, and also getting yourself into a position to have more influence. Um, work where you'll excel. This is kind of like the key of the personal fit thing, which I think is, is underemphasized, both for satisfaction and for having the ability to actually be really effective and make a big difference. Um, and obviously to figure that out, you need to do the first thing, which is like explore lots of different options. Um, work where you can have an influence on the most pressing causes. I, I didn't really emphasize this earlier, but obviously the impact you have in the role you're doing depends on what causes you're working on. So thinking a lot about what you think are the most pressing causes and then finding a way to have influence on those causes um, and developing the career capital you need to do that um, is really important. Um, and finally, test and adapt your plan. Don't see career choice as this one big decision, but um, as like a much ser smaller series of decisions where you kind of like come up with a hypothesis. You're almost like a scientist in your career. Like come up with a hypothesis about what you think you should do, find ways to test that, try things out, learn, and then go back and, and adapt once you've learned new things. Um, very finally, if you want to get more updates from 80,000 Hours, you can sign up to the newsletter. I'm also, I, I've got a little bit of a like, perverse incentive asking you to do this because 80,000 Hours are currently in Y Combinator in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a startup accelerator. And they've got this kind of big pitch um, that they've got to do to investors on Tuesday where they're kind of reporting on all their metrics. And one of their key metrics is newsletter signups. So <laughs> it would be really great if you want to help 80,000 Hours to sign up to the newsletter and help with those sign ups. But at the same time, I also think that you will, I also think that it's worth signing up because you know, they'll send just something like monthly updates and you'll find out about new pieces of research that might be harder to find on the website um, and career opportunities and things, um, it's, which is there. Um, and that's my email address if anyone has any questions or wants to get in touch with me. But I'm gonna put it back on the newsletter thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't worry about that. Okay, thank you very much.